Welcome back to the Super Sense Podcast, everybody. Super pumped to have you back here on the show. And today we've got a very special guest, Lawrence Moroni, calling in from Seattle. Lawrence, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here. Very, very excited and honored to have you on the show and for you know all these amazing things you're doing for the community. We've got a lot, a lot of things that I would love to talk to you about in the area of TensorFlow. Um, to maybe to kick us off, could you give us a quick overview? Who is uh, Lawrence Moroni for those of people who may have not yet encountered your courses and YouTube videos? Uh, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I really don't know. How do you answer the question? Who are you? <laughs> and like uh, in Les Mis, he says two four six zero one. <laughs> are you a Les Mis What is fan? that? No, oh, no, no uh, the Les Miserables is a, it's a musical and it's like one oh. of the songs in it. It's a guy's like, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And his convict number was 24601. So that oh, gives okay. us his answer. So, so I'm not 24601. <laughs> uh, that's that's Jean Valjean. So who am I? Uh, I'll, uh, well, I'll talk about what I do maybe. And yeah. so right now I work at Google. And mm -hmm. so I'm the lead AI advocate at Google. And it's my job to try and really rise the current around AI and machine learning so that like really developers can begin to understand it. It can become a little bit less exclusive. Um, sometimes like a little bit of a frustration I've had over the years was that a lot of AI and ML stuff is very academic. You know, it's all about reading papers, about doing math and those kind of things. And I, of course, there's still an element of that to it because it's very cutting edge. But you know, in the last few years, it has really changed that it's become much more approachable for software developers. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of really made that my pivot to really help software developers understand what AI is, what ML is, how they can really start taking advantage of these um, paradigms to be able to build a whole new scenario of apps and, you know, maybe help make the world a better place with them. Fantastic. And how has the uptake been? Have you seen... Uh, I'm assuming that you've been doing this, so you've been an AI advocate for over two years now, just, just in that specific role. Um, have you seen more and more developers becoming interested in uh, uh, TensorFlow and AI tools? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think it's a, it's a function of the times as well as a function of our efforts. And mm -hmm. um, But it's, uh, it's certainly been one of those things where um, developers... It's a difficult job because very often the landscape is moving so fast that it's hard for mm. you to keep up. You know, today you can be a cutting edge developer, tomorrow you can be a dinosaur. And <laughs> maybe not that fast, but it, it's certainly accelerating. Uh, so one of the things that I've seen with AI and ML is that a lot of people are identifying that, you know, that's very much the future for me as a developer. It's something that I have to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's been one of the forces that's been driving people towards, you know, learning AI and learning ML in, in huge numbers. Uh, and another one of the forces, of course, has been that it's been much easier to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that with frameworks such as TensorFlow, we've trying to make it as easy as possible for a software developer who doesn't have a PhD, who's, you know, um, like someone like me who hasn't done calculus in 20 years, you know, to be able to kind of sit down and start understanding what machine learned models are, how machine learned models work to start building them. And then to start actually turning those into applications that can be really useful for end users. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's the intersection of like trends like that, as well as then increased compute power. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it can be compute intensive to create mm -hmm. a machine learned model because there's a lot of heavy math going on. And mm -hmm. but with the dropping prices of uh, chips, particularly GPUs, uh, that you know that extra power now the GPU in my laptop is far more powerful than a supercomputer of five years ago for example you know that with that kind of power being then made available and put into developers hands that all of these trends I see intersection to intersecting I should say uh, to make this like a, a new and really really cool way to showcase your skills as a developer and hopefully build up mm, love it love it so uh, three trends you mentioned um that uh, the third one going from the uh, uh, most la recent one uh, or like in backward order. So computer computing power is increasing. Uh, number two was it's easier to do AI and ML and we definitely get back to that one. But I wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit more on this first trend you mentioned that developers are starting to feel that this is the future and like this is the future and I need to get in on this. I need to start doing AI uh, and ML. Why is that? Uh, oh, good question. <clears throat> I think there's a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them is sometimes there's always the feeling that every app that can be built has already been built. 
Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. And if I want to sit down and I want to like have a startup and create a new app and like, okay, I have a great idea for a to-do list app or something along those lines, I, I go to the app store and there are hundreds of them. I want to build an app for um, image processing. I go to the app stores, there's hundreds of them. So there tends to be that feeling that in order for you to distinguish yourself, you really need to set out with some new scenarios that aren't previously possible. Mm-hmm. And having machine learning in an app is one of the things that unlocks that. Um, I, whenever I do a presentation, I always show this slide where it's um, think about activity detection. Okay. And if you want to do an activity detection in traditional programming, you have data and you have rules that act on that data. So, for example, the data might be the accelerometer on the device is saying the speed that you're going at. And you can write if then rules that say, well, if your speed is this, you're probably walking. If your speed is this, you're probably running. And if your speed is this, you're probably biking. Mm-hmm. You know, and those would be very naive rules. And because different people run at different speeds and you might run slower uphill than downhill and all those kind of things. And as a result, using the traditional programming paradigm, uh, scenarios like activity detection are so difficult that they become infeasible, so we don't do them. Um, but now with the machine learning, the idea is like, well, you gather all the data from the devices and lots of people using it, and then they label it. So now you have to say, hey, look, this data is what walking looks like. This data is what running looks like, what biking looks like. And even things like golfing or swimming <laughs> that you couldn't really have if-then rules for, you can sort of gather the data and have that. And it's no coincidence now that the paradigm has shifted so that those kind of apps have become commonplace because of machine learning. And like things like the Apple Watch and the Google Watch have activity detection on them so yeah. that when you're out running or something like that, it knows that you're running so that it can calculate the calories that you're burning when you're running and those kind of things. So having that new programming paradigm has cracked open all of these new scenarios that weren't previously possible. And if I kind of like, you know, those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it, but -hmm. those who do learn from history are able to take advantage of it. And if I go back to the the last big revolution like this that I've seen was the emergence of the smart mobile device. And we went from like all of our compute being done on desktops and laptops to having compute done on these little black rectangles in our pocket. So having that little black rectangle in our pocket that's loaded with sensors made like all of these kind of new scenarios possible. And the one I always like to joke about is Uber, right? So before you had mobile devices, if you needed to get a taxi home, if if you're out at night, you have to stand on a street corner waving your arms around or you'd have to call a particular number and then wait on a street corner for them to come and get you and stuff like that. But now you've got this little device in your pocket that you can touch a button and then it will summon a car from the internet that'll come and pick you up and take you home. You know, that just wasn't possible on a laptop. You're not going to carry a laptop with you when you go out to the nightclub and try and call someone like that. So that kind of revolution in devices and in different new app types opened up all of these new scenarios of businesses that weren't previously possible. Instagram is another one. And having a new scenario for app development with machine learning and AI is where I'm excited because it's a similar type of revolution because it opens up new types of apps that you would just not have been able to build before now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Would you say that developers coming uh, into the world of artificial intelligence through tools like uh, Keras and um, TensorFlow uh, can also, for instance, maybe somebody's not that interested in developing apps, which is definitely, as, as you pointed out, like a, a great way to go. But uh, do do those tools open up new possibilities in the space of just developing AI software or maybe integrating AI in websites for web developers and, and so on? Absolutely, yes. Um, so uh, I always like to think about it this as a new programming paradigm. Mm-hmm. And whenever you have a new programming paradigm, that new programming paradigm can be extended to websites, can be extended to backend applications, can be extended to mobile apps and all of those kind of things. Provided you have the tools, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And so in this case, like for example, you mentioned websites. One of the things that we've been working really hard on is TensorFlow JS, where it's a JavaScript implementation of TensorFlow so that you can both train models and execute models in the browser using JavaScript. Mm. So if you're a front-end web developer and you want to have ML models that do something fancy within your web page, you can do so. Amazing. Of course, if you're a if you're a backend uh, developer that wants to deploy stuff to the web, then by the fact that TensorFlow.js runs on Node, um, then you're covered. Um, yeah. Alternatively, if you want to build like a model that runs inference in the cloud, and you want your server to be able to 
for example, I don't know, upload a picture and have a server return the picture, what the, the contents of that picture. Um, that's also possible as a web developer for you to do that. So think about where the inference actually happens. Um, you that's can cool. have it on a you can have it native on a device. You can have it within a browser, be that on a device or on a desktop, or you can have it running on a server, in which case your browser can talk to it, your desktop can talk to it, your mobile device can talk to it, that kind of thing. Wow, fantastic. Love it. And is uh, TensorFlow.js already available? Yeah, yeah. TensorFlow.js is out there. So That's awesome. Is, That's awesome. It's really, there's lots of really fun, cool demos with it. It's like, I yeah. wish the demos of everything were as fun as the JS demos, <laughs> but go take a look. That's awesome. We'll, we'll link that to the show notes. I hope you're enjoying this amazing episode. We'll get straight back to it after this super quick announcement. Data Science Go Virtual. Have you registered to attend yet? If not, make sure to check it out, datasciencego.com slash virtual. The dates are coming up June 20th to 21st. It's a weekend. On the Saturday, we've got talks and workshops for newcomers and transitioners. And on the Sunday, we've got uh, talks and workshops for practitioners and managers. So whatever level you are, this is the virtual event for you. And it's absolutely free. Yes, it's absolutely free, but the number of seats is limited. So apply to attend now. You can find uh, the event at datasciencego.com slash virtual. Come enjoy the talks, have lots of fun, network with your peers. Even if you don't manage to get in for whatever reason, you will get the recordings afterwards if you register for the event. Once again, the website is datasciencego.com slash virtual. No reason not to attend, no reason not to register. So make sure to jump on this opportunity. Only a matter of days left until this happens. And I look forward to seeing you there. And now let's jump straight back into this amazing episode. Um, and I think we've gradually transitioned to the second point you mentioned, the second trend that has become easier. So if you could... Um, Describe to us what is TensorFlow? Like, how does it make building AI easier, especially if I don't have a PhD in uh, computer science? Yeah, well, I don't have a PhD in computer science. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, so I always like to think of TensorFlow as an ecosystem as opposed to like a product or anything like that, because there's a whole bunch of parts to it. Uh, the first and the main part that we tend to kind of use synonymously with TensorFlow is uh, the framework for machine learning. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a set of libraries that are Python based or Swift based that you can use on your developer workstation to create machine learn models. Mm -hmm. You can either create low level machine learn models that use something called graph based execution, or my personal preference is you can create higher level models that you've got a high level API. Keras is our high level API for that, where you can just define your models in Python code. Or like I said, we're also working on a version with Swift. Um, so you define your models in that, where it, a model that I'm talking about is, a, for example, a neural network that has multiple layers. And it's as simple as saying, this layer has this many neurons, this layer has this many neurons, this layer has this many, or this is a layer type like a convolution or an LSTM or something along those lines, but it's one line of code per layer that you define your model, you train your model, and then once your model is trained, then you can start running inference on it. So that, that's the, 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 the programmer part of it, shall I say. But beyond that, there is a whole ecosystem. Uh, there's JS that I mentioned earlier on. There's uh, my, one of my personal favorites, uh, something called TensorFlow Lite, where what TensorFlow Lite is, is think of it as two tools. One is a converter that, makes your, that optimizes your models to make them mobile friendly. And then the other one is a set of interpreters for those models that run on different mobile devices. So an mm -hmm. iOS-based interpreter, an Android-based interpreter, and a microcontroller-based interpreters, as well as a Python-based one that you can then run on like Raspberry Pi or other embedded systems that you can execute Python on. And then beyond that, when you start thinking in a more enterprise-y way where you have like uh, large-scale infrastructures that you want to run inference on, we have something called TFX, which is TensorFlow Extended, and that's the big machine learning pipeline that you could use to power like things like Google. And mm. uh, so if you want like large scale machine learning models in production, that's what it's all about. So it's really that big ecosystem where we're trying to cover everything. Okay. Um, what do I need to know to get started? What do you need to know to get started? Um, I would say if you have never done any ML before and you really want to start dipping your toe in it, the only thing you really need to know is a little Python. Mm. And so the very the, the entry level stuff, um, 
just if you if you understand a little Python, you're good to go. And um, I like it in that way because I think Python is the simplest language in the world to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ecosystem around it of various libraries makes it really powerful as, really, as well as really simple. And so I'd say if you don't know Python, that would probably be the first thing. You don't need to be an mm -hmm. expert, but just kind of understand the structures of Python and how it works. And then there's so many great learning materials out there once you know a little Python. Um, I created a course on the Google Developers Channel called ML Foundations. Uh, which is like a 10 video series that just really take you from, okay, I don't know anything about machine learning, but I want to understand how the whole paradigm works through being able to build uh, computer vision models and natural language processing models, you know, basic well, ones, but it's, 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 you know, it's enough to kind of get you started to understand how the ball, how the ball rolls, how the whole thing mm -hmm. is working and to see, to kind of just break the ice. And then once you've done that, there's just lots of great materials out there to help you go deeper. I teach some on Coursera. There's a lots of great books. Um, is now the time to show my favorite book? <laughs> yes, yes. This is my favorite book for right now. It's called Hands On Hands. Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn, Keras, and TensorFlow by Aurelian Giron. Um, mm -hmm. A terrific, terrific book. And Aurelian's a friend of mine, but I'm still plugging it. If, you, if we did this uh, podcast six months from now, I'd show a different book, which would be my mm. one that I'm waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what's your book going to be about? Uh, it's called AI and Machine Learning for Coders. And, mm. uh, so it's really about that. So it's uh, like, it, uh, it, I wrote it to really complement this book because yeah. this book is absolutely brilliant, but you have to know a bit about machine learning and AI already to get the most yeah. out of it. But if yeah. you read my book first, you'll get a lot more out of this one. It's, okay, fantastic. How was the experience writing a book? Uh, it was good. It was good. I've yeah. written many books in my time. Oh, yes, you so, have. That's right. Um, I, I've give, I kind of had given up on writing computer books. The last one mm -hmm. I wrote was about two years ago on Firebase. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just like I'd reached my point where I think I've written about 20 of them. And I'm like, it's mm -hmm. diminishing returns at that point. But mm -hmm. there's a funny story behind mm -hmm. why I wrote another book. And it was actually to do with this book. Okay. And so I was, uh, I get to spend a lot of time in Asia with my work. Um, well, mm -hmm. not right now because of lockdowns and things. But back last October, I was in Tokyo uh, speaking at mm -hmm. a conference. Wow. And uh, so um, I love to visit bookstores. Um, mm -hmm. Being an author, of course, I love to visit bookstores just in case they might have my book. <laughs> and this, this book had just come out. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go visit some bookstores to see if I can find Aurelian's book. And there was another in book. In Japan. In Japan. And there was another book I wanted to buy. I'm going to reach back and find it that I'd heard about. And it's the Manga Guide to Machine Learning. Oh, I've heard of that book. I've heard of it. Is it good? It's I can't awesome. believe you have it. I don't read Japanese, but I love yeah. the pictures, you know, but it's, yeah. it's all done in manga, right? So how wow. machine learning. So, um, so I wanted to find this. And yeah. so there was a bookstore, a famous bookstore in Tokyo that has beehives on the roof. Mm. Wow. And um, so real I'm beehives, like, like active. Real active. beehives were wow. active bees. And Why would you do honey. that in a, in a store? Well, so dangerous. It's basically on the roof of the store. So it's wow. like there's nothing in the store itself. And then they have a cafe in the store that sells honey from mm. the beehives on the roof. Amazing. And this, this is close to the Imperial Palace and all the gardens around that. So the bees pollinate that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, I got to visit that bookstore. Mm. And so I went and I was looking for this, like I said. Mm. And I went to visit that bookstore because I wanted to try a coffee with the honey. Yeah. And um, I walked into the bookstore and the first thing I saw was this. Wow. And the uh, hands on Aurelian. Yeah, machine the, learning. So, this machine learning Aurelian's book. And um, I had been working with Aurelian on some stuff. So, I was kind of texting him, telling him, sent him a picture and said, Look, your book's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And I went up the escalators to the computer science department. And this book was at the top of the escalator. And then I went to look for my manga book. And I found yeah. Aurelian's book everywhere. So, after that, I was like, I really want to write an O'Reilly book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I pitched them the idea of, like I just mentioned, of something that, like you know, really, really kind of works complementary to Aurelian's book, and I love the idea. So uh, hmm. I just finished writing it last week, and uh, congrats! That's awesome. It, it complements it so much; it even has a little salamander on the cover. Like this <laughs> one, so. Nice, very nice. Um, it's a it's a very needed book. Um, we find that in our audience, there are lots of um, developers who are transitioning into the space of data science and AI. And that's been the case ever since we started. And 
Um, I was very impressed by the numbers you shared before the podcast. If you would don't mind saying them again for um, the the community numbers. Sure, sure. So when I started um, this journey, um, it kind of started out of, in some ways, frustration uh, with mm. machine learning and with um, the way machine learning was being taught to developers. And, and I approached some folks in Google and I was like, um, I read a paper, a research paper that showed that there were 300,000 AI practitioners in the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then based on various developer surveys, somewhere between 20 and 30 million software developers in the world. Wow. And, but all of the materials that were out there for learning machine learning and AI were very much catered towards the 300,000, mm. not towards the 30 million. Mm-hmm. And I saw there was a great opportunity for us, and particularly with uh, TensorFlow being such a developer-friendly product, uh, that there was a, uh, there's a great opportunity for us to kind of double down on making it more developer-friendly so mm-hmm. that we could reach the 30 million instead of the 300,000. Mm -hmm. and uh, google we always like to say how do you 10x Um, if you want to do something how do you 10x and to me that was a clear example of 10x so of the 30 million well yeah yeah, definitely but i was thinking of the 30 million software developers if you could reach 10 percent of them and train them to be ai developers that's 3 million and that's 10x of the 300,000. and even when you go back and you look at how the 300,000 was measured yeah. And you can always tell a lot about something, not just by the number, but how you measure it. And the only way at the time that the, it was being measured was by these are people who have their name on a paper. Mm. Uh, so a published paper oh, wow. around uh, AI or machine learning or something like that, which tells you everything about the the emphasis that the industry has. Uh, yeah, and, like research. Know, this was, yeah, so this was like mid-2017 um, mm. when I kind of started wow. these conversations. And um, it happened to be a former manager of mine was managing the AI outreach. And I love this guy. And we always worked really well. So I approached him and said that. And then he was like, okay, come join us and uh, see if we can, you know, if this is something that we can do. And then at the time, the plans in TensorFlow were to launch TensorFlow 2.0 with more high level APIs, uh, more Keras based APIs, for example, to merge Keras into TensorFlow to reach that audience. So it just happened to be one of those beautiful sweet spots and a nice piece Mm. of serendipity. Uh, So that's why I came on board to start trying to drive developer awareness um, of machine learning and AI, as opposed to researcher awareness. Uh Uh-huh, gotcha. Um, Since you mentioned TensorFlow 2.0, could you tell us a bit about the difference? What's, what, like it was huge news when it came out. So what's the difference between TensorFlow 1.x and 2.0? Uh, I mean, there's many differences, but I'll just really highlight two of them, I think. Uh, One of them is more of an emphasis on high-level APIs, like I just Mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the past, um, the the APIs were um, almost researcher-focused. They were all about power. Mm -hmm. Um, Almost like it's like when driving a car, right? Mm -hmm. You can have an automatic gearbox or you can drive stick shift, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. those people who are performance drivers uh, drive stick shift. Right, mm-hmm. they want to have that absolute control over when the transmission changes gears, so that you can have a the optimum acceleration curve, so that you can ex- you can accelerate and you can race. The average driver, um, you know, who just wants to get from A to B safely, you know, will generally drive an automatic. And in some mm-hmm. ways, I like to see that as the paradigm. With TensorFlow One, we were all about power. We were all about having that fine grained control. And it was all about this kind of graph-based execution. What's execution? (laughs) Execution. Uh, This graph-based execution so that you have that real fine-grained control over your models and how your models work. But then with TensorFlow 2, we wanted to enhance, not replace, but enhance that with um, the ability to have high-level APIs so that you can focus on things like your model architecture, prototyping, as well as building out that ecosystem that I spoke about, you know, with TensorFlow Mm -hmm. Lite, TFX, and all those, Mm -hmm. and TensorFlow.js and all those other things. That'd be the first big thing, would be really that kind of additional emphasis. And then the second one, which kind of correlates to that, was um, to have eager execution by default. As programmers, eager execution is our default, where we see lines of code, and this line executes, then this line, then this line, then this line. But non-eager based execution or graph based execution is very different, where it's a case of you load this line into a graph, you load this line, you load this line, you load this line, everything's in a graph, and then you execute the graph in one shot. Uh It can be much more powerful, but it's more difficult to debug. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, It's kind of like the difference between interpreted and compiled languages, is that 
correct? Kind of, kind of. I mean, even when something is compiled, it still executes line by line, right? Um, ah, you know, okay. compilation. Uh, but the the whole idea was, I mean, yeah, it is kind of like that, though. But the whole idea was that um, the graph based is faster. It's uh -huh. more optimized, it's more powerful, but it's not quite as friendly for the programmer, for the developer uh -huh. as eager based. Okay. Uh, so having eager based, having high level APIs like Keras become first le first class citizens, as well as like building out the full ecosystem, like with TensorFlow Lite, JS, TFX, that was really the emphasis around TensorFlow 2.0. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. that's why the excitement kind of took off because going back to my 300,000 versus 30 million, analogy it, it, this is certainly much more in the sweet spot of the 30 million than it had been um, mm -hmm. and that's why we're continuing to invest in that fantastic i i also heard uh, there's quite a bit of um people um complaining or unhappy that tensor when you switch from tensorflow 1.x to 2.0 uh you couldn't transfer your ai models like they weren't co uh, compatible with the new version is that going to be the case like uh, going forward or are they going to be compatible from now on? Uh, I think the goal is always to make them compatible. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, whenever you create something new... Um, Especially if that's like, radically different like yeah. that. And you can always have regression problems, right? Whenever yeah. you create something new. So as you continue any product, right? Not just TensorFlow, you know, mm -hmm. you release a new version of iOS, you got to make sure your uh, applications continue to work with the new version that you don't end up with regression issues. I think in this case, there was the paradigm change rather than a breaking change is the, mm -hmm. is the, is the biggest kind of leap that one has to make where, you know, if I've spent two years building graph based models, now there's this new option of creating these eager based high level Keras models. Do I continue working in graph based models or do I make the change? Um, I think is one of the things that people were probably a little bit confused about. Uh, we do want to make, uh, and I do want to underline that graph-based models are still a first-class citizen. Um, mm -hmm. It's just by the fact that we've brought in eager, we've brought in high-level APIs for you know making Keras-based models as part of TensorFlow doesn't mean that the graph-based ones are going away. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the idea is to open up more scenarios as opposed to um, continuing to double down on a single scenario. Gotcha, understood. Um, let's shift gears a bit, a bit and talk about careers. So I loved your example at the uh, you gave just before we started the podcast of uh, bytecode and, for instance, like a Java developer. Do you mind sharing that again? Because I think it lays a great foundation about what it is to use AI in business applications and in different types of applications these days. Sure, sure. So um, I always like to think about it this way, that... Um, there's a different task involved in learning machine learning as there is into learning programming models. Mm. And so my focus is generally on programming models. And uh, like I mentioned, my book is called AI and Machine Learning for Coders. Mm -hmm. And with programming models, then you're writing code, you're mm -hmm. creating layers in a neural network, um, you're defining like how that neural network is going to compile with a loss function and an optimizer and those kind of things. You don't necessarily need to know all of the underlying mechanics of how these things work, and particularly all the underlying math of how these things mm -hmm. work in order to be successful. And the paradigm I always like to use is like, if you're a Java programmer, if you understand how a compiler turns your code into bytecode and how that bytecode executes, that might make you a better programmer, but you don't need to know that in order to be a programmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I always like to say it in the same way. So like, if you want to get into machine learning, often when you start reading a lot of the literature and even my favorite manga book kind of does mm -hmm. it, it tends to then start going into a lot of the math. Um, mm. There's a there's a process for machine learning called gradient descent, which mm. is very, very heavy on calculus. And often mm -hmm. when you're learning machine learning, it's the first thing that you learn because it's the thing that underpins most machine learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you feel that you have to learn the calculus to understand how machine learning, how gradient descent works and how that empowers machine learning, the paradigm for that is like starting with like looking at bytecode before you start looking at Java code mm -hmm. or starting mm -hmm. looking at MSIL before you look at C sharp or starting mm -hmm. to look at, you know, assembly or like ones and zeros before you look at high level coding languages. And, uh, yeah. So that, that's the thing that I always want to encourage the 30 million was like, you don't really need to do this stuff in order to be able to do machine. Absolutely. The example I use very similar to yours is 
driving a car to get from A to B. You don't need to know what a uh, their camshaft versus a crankshaft and under the hood. Like you don't need to know that stuff. Um, and uh, and that's what we teach. I love that you you say that because like often I face um, criticism from like people I talk to, especially in academia. They're like, well, you got to teach the math. But in our courses, we don't teach the math. We focus on uh, the practical plus the intuition. And by intuition, what I mean is like we explain intuitively how does gradient descent work? You know, that example of the, the shape and the ball falling down and they're finding the local minimum and so on. Um, so you're exactly right. And it's, you know, that's the thing is like, you know, if you, and I would like add, like if you, first of all, if you know how the ball gets to the bottom, that can make you a better machine learning yeah. developer, but you don't need to know that in order to start. And like, if you know how your car runs and how the camshaft and all that kind of stuff works, that can make you a better driver and look after your car in a better way. But you don't need to know that in order to drive through this. Stuff. And most drivers don't know that, right? Like ninety nine percent of drivers drive all the time, not knowing that, and they just like they need to know how to press gas. You know, need to pass the driving exam, where to put the petrol in, and they can get to A to B. Like you can live your whole life and never like I. <laughs> I hate to admit this, but I I often don't even know how to put oil into my car. Like I have to ask somebody to help me out with that, and I'm fine driving. <laughs> I think the selling point for me to buy an electric car was they told me I don't need to put oil in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Awesome. So um, what, uh, what can people do to kind of like overcome this fear? Because it's, it's natural to have this kind of, ooh, AI, you know, math. Even knowing that you don't have to learn math, you still will be like, how do, how do I get over this fear to, to see that I, I really don't need to know the math unless I really want to? Yeah, I think um, just to go through some of the learning scenarios. And uh, so earlier I mentioned I have a 10 part course called ML Foundations, which is on the this Google is on Developers YouTube, right? channel. Yeah, it's on YouTube, Google Developers channel. Okay. And my goal, my goal with that was it's 10 videos. Each is like six or seven minutes long. No, sorry, they're a bit more. They're about 10, 15 minutes long, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, those 10 videos and the idea is with each one of them, if you go through them, I try to give you a very simple coding scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, like the very first video is like I kind of teach what machine learning is, what the scenario is, how it kind of like is all about pattern matching ultimately, and then mm -hmm. show some simple code for um, inferring the relationship between two numbers. Mm -hmm. And so the people can see that it's all about inference. And then by the time they get onto episode two, they're using exactly the same paradigm and exactly the same pattern to do a basic computer vision scenario. Mm -hmm. By episode three, they're in an advanced computer vision scenario. Wow, nice. And, stuff like that and i think one of the things is like you know from working with students um i found that like when people kind of start doing something and seeing that it works mm -hmm. and they they do it themselves and they see that it works they're not downloading a thousand lines of code written by somebody else that they've no idea what it does to get a demo yeah. working or they're writing 10 lines of code then 20 lines of code then 50 lines of code and it actually works that builds up that internal confidence um, gets rid of the imposter syndrome and makes people realize, you know, I think I can do this and I think I'm beginning mm -hmm. to get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that to me is like the key to helping developers because, you know, developer, being a developer, I think is the greatest career in the world, but it does have its challenges. And one of the challenges is that there's so many frameworks coming at you thick and fast mm -hmm. from so many vendors and so many paradigms that you don't have time to learn them all. Uh, but if you have like the ability to be successful with one quickly, um, that's the kind of thing that can really help you kind of gain an affinity with that framework and maybe gain an affinity with that career direction. Hmm. And that's what I love about Keras and TensorFlow that you only need like five, 10, I don't know, 20 lines of code to already have a neural network set up and running, right? You don't need to be writing a thousand lines of code. It's, it's kind of almost like drag and drop, you know, like building something out of Legos. Put this here, put this here, specify your, you know, do your hyperparameters and boom, it's working. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I mean, you're not going to build like a, a world changing app with that. Uh, yeah. But the idea is that um, what I really love about it is that the, the paradigm of um, like it's having a machine and further rules that match the data to the labels. Uh, once you know machine learning, you'll know exactly what I mean when I say that. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, like having that paradigm and Seeing how that paradigm works from the smallest Hello World application all the way up through the most advanced applications. And then you can implement that pattern, that paradigm in five lines of code for a simple scenario, and then take that through to the more advanced scenarios is 
to me, that was like really eye-opening. And one of the great differences about machine learning, and one of the things that makes start getting started quite simple and being able to move to advanced scenarios pretty easy. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I find um, two things probably are quite important for somebody jumping into a new area because that's that's what we do. Um, we help people transition to data science, machine learning, things like that, and comments that we hear from uh, people and just over the years we've discovered that two most important well, like two very important things are having a community that you can ask questions and get support and answer that you know you're not alone learning this stuff that you don't have to like sit and read through a book every time or like you can you can just ask a question or somebody's already asked a question and somebody's answered it and the second thing would be that you have a path you know where you're going the direction and uh, I know you mentioned before we started that you have a uh, TensorFlow certificate exam and it's quite a tough exam, but at least it's like it's like a point towards which you're going. Do you mind elaborating on those two, the community part and the pathway of like where a person needs to be going and, and what the certificate exam is that you have? Sure, sure. I'll start with the second part of that, like the certificate exam and all that. Um, so this was born out of... Um, there's a lot of fundamental misunderstanding about, because it's such a new thing, machine learning and AI, there's a lot of fundamental misunderstanding about the skills required to get a job in it. Mm. And I've seen like a lot of things where people will be like, you know, here's the question I got in an interview for a job. And it was like something along the lines of, you know, um, explain how the Atom optimizer works. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's like, you similar to what we talked about earlier on, yeah. like you don't need to know how the engine of your car works in order to be able to drive. But there was so much misunderstanding in the field that it was like people who are interviewing don't know what to ask. So they were like, okay, well, what's gradient descent? How does an atom optimizer work? You know, because that's how the skills were actually taught. The very right. mathematical concept of machine learning It's very valuable skills. I don't want to dismiss mm -hmm. them. But when like somebody was looking for a job, it was like, you know, I know how to program computer vision. You're looking for something in computer vision. I can't go to a whiteboard and explain the math behind how an atom optimizer works and should I need to in order to be able to get the job. So that was part of like, you know, this this got born out of uh, things like that. And like it was evidence that we've seen in the industry of those kind of things happening. So we did some research and we kind of dug into like, well, what are the skills that are really needed right now? Uh, by developers if they want to become involved in companies that create AI apps or create ML apps. And there were really three. And in order of sequence, it was number one was definitely computer vision. Uh, so most people who uh, that we saw that were hiring, you know, were looking for in ML skills, were looking for computer vision skills. Mm -hmm. um, how to build CNNs, to be able to understand computer vision, to build image classifiers, object detectors, those kind of things. Number two was uh, natural language processing. So, um, so some, somewhat behind uh, computer vision, but it's still mm -hmm. number two was natural language processing. And again, to be able to build models that handled NLP. And then number three was sequence modeling. Uh, so being able to understand sequences of data to be able to you know, be, predict the next thing, like you know, what's the weather gonna be like tomorrow? Uh, who's gonna win the World Series or whatever, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, the, the, I came up with the strategy then of creating courses and that's the TensorFlow in practice specialization that's on Coursera, as well as a number of like courses that we've helped like universities create that teach those fundamental skills. Mm -hmm. And then once the world had been seeded with um, lessons teaching those fundamental skills, then it's a case of now if we launch a certificate exam that tests those fundamental skills. Mm -hmm. And when somebody passes that exam, we have a way of showcasing those folks. So it's on tensorflow.org slash certificate. Um, okay. So if you pass the exam, you get your name and your badge on there that we show, hey, you know, this person has passed this exam. They have these skills, computer vision, natural language processing, sequence modeling, uh, basic TensorFlow, those kind of things. So now if a company is looking for ML skills, instead of them looking up academic research papers and saying, oh, maybe I should check if this person can explain what an atom optimizer is, that they can actually say, as a developer, can you build a CNN? Mm. Show me your code. Uh, oh, here's your certificate that Google shows it. And to kind of really just try to seed the whole employment um, in that way or to help seed uh, the whole employment in that way so that we have a way of showing that these people have these skills 
And these are the skills that we found that companies are looking for so that we can bring the two together. Wow, love it. I'm just so excited listening to this. This is amazing. Um, and you said this is recent, right? A couple of months. We launched the uh, certificate exam at the TensorFlow Dev Summit back in March. Um, March so, 2020. So, uh, yeah, March 2020. So we've launched okay. it then. And uh, so, yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's site. Uh, we're seeing more and more people passing every day. And it's... Uh, it's well, How many have passed really so far? You know, I don't have the numbers on hand. Um, yeah. It's in the hundreds. Um, in the hundreds. I, I wow. Really Wow, if you listen to this podcast, you're going to be one of the first thousand to pass this exam. That's amazing. It's funny because we have a map on the website yeah. that you can go to the map and like where people are from. You yeah. can, there's like a pin in the map. So there's a lot of times like, you know, are you going to be the first in your country? To do <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I grew up between Ireland and Wales. And the last time I visited, there was a pin in Ireland. So I was so excited. But there wasn't a pin in Wales yet. So maybe. Uh, you should pass it. <laughs> to put a pin. <laughs> oh, I wrote the exam, so I'm not allowed to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Wow. Love it. That's that's really exciting news. I um, It's going to add a lot of structure because you're right. Like I, I sometimes feel sad for hiring managers who are tasked to build a data science team. And they don't know what data science is and they put like everything under the sun into the job description it's crazy yeah yeah it's uh it, it really is but i think i mean to be fair i think that's just because the demand is so high but the maturity of the industry right now is still relatively low mm. um mm. that people really don't know what to do there but as the industry matures and that's one of the things that we're trying to do is to help it along in maturing then I yeah. think those kind of issues will go away. I'm just thinking, like, if you remember, like, like a few years ago when mobile development was like sky high, red hot. Yeah. You know, yeah. That the, the iPhone came out, what was it, 2007? And you would see like job listings in 2010 looking for somebody with five years objective. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. exactly. But uh, I was going to say that now is the perfect time. Like, once this industry matures, it'll be harder and harder to break through. Like accounting, right? Like it's a great industry. I studied accounting, but you you gotta like you gonna have to go climb the career ladder. You have to you know progress. There's 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 very few cases I like I can even think of that somebody studies accounting or just like uh, like learns it online and then boom they're like the top accountant in the world. No, like it's it's a very mature industry. Where same thing is gonna happen with AI. Maybe 10, 20, 30 years from now. Now is the time. If you're a developer and you're thinking of getting into AI and uh, ML, now is the time because it's so immature. You can like skyrocket your career. You can change the world because like it's just it's just it's so new and everything's all over the place. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I always like to encourage people who are underrepresented in our industry. You know, women are underrepresented. Many minorities are underrepresented in our industry. That. You know, I particularly encourage them that now is the time because um, I think when you have these skills that people really, really, really desperately need, they tend to see through that prejudice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's one of the things that removes those prejudice lenses. And so I graduated in 1991, and that was like the worst recession in uh, history at that time in the UK. And they've been worse ones since, but at that time it was the worst one. And you probably can hear it a little bit in my voice, although it's been a long time, but I'm actually Irish. And at that time, Irish people were very, very heavily discriminated against for a variety of reasons. And I remember walking out into the world with my freshly minted degree, thinking everybody would give me a job and nobody would give me a job because of the recession. And then in some cases, even when I went to some interviews or to some job fairs, people wouldn't talk to me when they heard my accent. It was crazy. And um, so, uh, but at that time, uh, 1991 into 1992, this new technology was beginning to emerge that seemed like science fiction. It was called the web, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays we all use the web and the web is part of our everyday lives, but it was absolute cutting edge, bleeding edge, you know, in the early 1990s. And I realized that when I skilled myself up in the web, um, I went back and I studied like a post-grad, I graduated from that in 93, I skilled myself up in the web. Then suddenly employers were lining up to talk to me. Mm. Uh, the folks that wouldn't even let me into the room because they heard my accent were now lining up to talk to me. And, as, and I've been able to build a wonderful career as a result. So I think, as you were saying, it's like, you know, you can get into AI and ML now and, you know, it's the opportunity for you to rocket boost your career. 
but it is also, you know, for folks who are finding it hard to get into traditional programming careers or who are sidelined in their traditional programming careers, it's a great way for you to kind of bust that glass ceiling too. Hmm. Wow, thank you. That's that's really uh, insightful advice. And I think brings us nicely to the topic of community. W- what is the TensorFlow community like these days? It's vibrant. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, so we have a community manager. You should have her on to talk someday. She's great, uh, Joanna. Sure. And uh, but she, the the community is I, it's just growing amazingly. Um, last week I had to do a webcast to the uh, the TensorFlow community in Korea uh, mm. because they had just hit I think it was seventy five thousand users. Um, wow! Congrats. It's, it, it's growing amazing. And that's just in one country. So I think you know the community is growing, and I think part of it has been that as more and more developers are getting involved, and it's becoming more and more welcoming for people who don't have PhDs or who don't have like that kind of deep level math, and um, so that you know we're all kind of in this boat together where we can all help each other out, and that realization is kind of really dawning heavily. Um, mm-hmm. I see communities just growing hugely, and uh, so it's really exciting. Like I teach a course on Coursera, um, a number of courses on Coursera. But like one of my courses there just crossed 150,000 students. Wow, congrats. That, like it, that, that just amazes me, like that level of engagement. Uh, the YouTube channel for TensorFlow, I run that, and we just crossed 250,000 subscribers yeah. uh, last week. Um, I think TensorFlow itself, was it, we announced, was it, I think it was 10 million downloads. Um, hmm. You know, things like that, that we just see that the community is vibrant, and it, it's a lot of fun to be a part of it. Fantastic. Is there kind of like, by the way, for everybody listening, I um, highly recommend subscribing to the YouTube channel. There's really cool videos that are coming. You can see Lawrence uh, presenting there. Um, Way too much of me. That's the only problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if is there a centralized place where people can like ask questions, get answers? Uh, where does the community hang out mostly? Yeah, so on tensorflow.org, there's a community page, uh, which like lists details of all the in-person communities you can join in your local area, as well as like a number of uh, distribution lists of email that you can ask questions. The first and uh, the, the granddaddy of them all is discuss at tensorflow.org. Uh, you can send like emails there. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, if you go to the tensorflow.org slash community site, you'll see details on all of the communities. I definitely would encourage joining an in-person community. Uh-huh. As soon as you can. I mean, obviously, right now we're still in COVID, and it's in-person stuff is is more difficult. Um, yeah. People are doing them virtually on Zoom and on Google Hangouts, but uh, I think if you can join a an in-person community, that would certainly be a, a great way to get connected. Or or start an in-person community if there isn't one in your city. That's a great point. Absolutely, and details on how to do that are on that site. Um, there are they call them TFUGs, uh, TensorFlow user groups, uh, huh. kind of spinning up all the time. And there's details on how to do that on the tensorflow.org slash community site. Okay, fantastic. Auto auto ML. What are your thoughts on auto ML? And you know, like from from being in the industry and like uh, being an AI advocate, do you think auto ML will replace data scientists in the long run? <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, like anything else, it's a tool to help us make be more efficient. Uh, so one of the things that you find when you're building models is um, hyperparameter tuning. Mm-hmm. What loss function do I use? How many nodes in this layer? How do I? Have, what size filter do I use on my CNN? You know, all of those kind of things. That it's a lot of trial and error. Unless you're a deep expert on this stuff who knows the papers backwards, that's not me. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of trial and error there, and like really in optimizing your model. And AutoML is one of the things to really help you do that. You know, in the same way as like, you know, does a debugger make a, um, a programmer obsolete? You know, does uh, profiling <laughs> yeah. tools make a programmer obsolete? It's the same kind of thing like that. It's just something that you can use to make yourself a more efficient developer. I think you're always going to have to have the need for the person to get the ball rolling, to define the architecture, and then to use something like AutoML as a tool for that. Um, in addition to AutoML, I would also encourage, because um, AutoML is this, big infrastructure, this like, you know, the, the, uh, for creating large scale models, but I'd also kind of encourage that there's something called Keras tuning, uh, which is an open source API that you can so, kind of sort of do the same thing, where you can kind of, you'll create your model, you'll think about the loss functions, optimizers, model architecture, all that kind of stuff that you're going to do, 
But then with Keras tuning, what you can do is then say, okay, you know, try this uh, range of this hyperparameter, try this range of neurons, try these ranges of filters, those kind of things. And what it will do is it will basically go through every option, train your model with every option. Uh, you have a target thing, for example, model accuracy or loss, and then it will report back to you when it's done of the model architecture that gave you the desired loss or model accuracy. Nice. So it's kind of auto ml in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I actually like to do that a lot. Like I, I have a GPU under my desk over here behind yeah. me. And sometimes I kind of sort of do a tweak for a few hours to come up with what I think is the best model. Yeah. Uh, and then use Keras tuning on that, run it overnight and see what Keras tuning came back to me. If nothing else, just to validate that I had the model right. But often it's a case of tweak this or tweak that and you'll get a better model. Oh, nice. so, you know, so not all of us can have an auto ML infrastructure at our fingertips <laughs> that we can tune yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but like with Keras tuning open source and free, you can kind of sort of do that stuff. And you'll see once you start doing that, that it's making you a more effective developer as opposed to replacing you as a yeah, love it. Love that. Um, okay, well, and to finish off, what does the future look like? Like, what, what do you see in the future of AI, uh, TensorFlow, and developers intersecting with uh, AI developers, let's say, three to five years from now? Sure. Um, so instead of what the future looks like, I always like to say, this is what I think success looks like. <laughs> Okay. And, and, and what I think success looks like is that we have a future where this isn't a special cornered uh, skill, that this is just a part of every developer's toolbox. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once upon a time, mobile developers were the special breed. You know, there were the general developers and then there were the mobile developers. But now everybody's a mobile developer as well. Almost everybody like has to have mobile skills as part of their developer toolbox or web skills or database skills as part of their developer toolbox. And I think you know what success will look like is that when AI and ML skills aren't this specialized corner case, but they are the thing that's part of every developer's toolbox and it becomes normalized in that way. And then once we have that and the ML paradigm and building things with the ML paradigm becomes a normal way of building applications, then what I was talking about right, right back at the beginning was like all these new scenarios that none of us have even thought about yet will have applications for those scenarios. And we'll have these new ecosystems around those applications. And mm -hmm. that to me is what success will look like. Fantastic. Hopefully it won't Love take it. as much long as five years. Hopefully we'll be there <laughs> sooner. <laughs> Fantastic. Never know if these exponential trends might happen sooner for sure. Yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. Well, Lawrence, thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure. Um, how can our listeners uh, find you, maybe follow your career, things that you're doing in the world of TensorFlow? Sure. Uh, so youtube.com slash TensorFlow is pretty good. I make a lot of videos on there. I run that site and it'd be, be nice to get more subscribers. And uh, so that would be good. Uh, to find me personally, Twitter is probably the best. Uh, L Moroni, L-M-O-R-O-N-E-Y. So I'm on there. And um, otherwise, you can just reach out to me, um, like LinkedIn, Twitter, any of those. And uh, I, I try to answer as many questions as I can. Fantastic. Lawrence, thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. It's been a blast.